Today we're going to draw a portrait using a photograph and a grid for scaling. Now normally I measure my grid off using a ruler or a yardstick, but in this case I'm going to use a yardstick and a pre-made template to make a two inch grid on this paper. My predetermined size is going to be a two inch grid and I'm going to have five squares by seven squares, meaning my paper is going to be ten inches by fourteen inches. This will make the drawing approximately actual size when we look at a portrait and the size of the head. Now the photograph that I'm going to be working from is 5 by 7. That is proportions, not necessarily actual measurements. What's important is that I have a grid drawn on it that is 5 squares by 7 squares, not rectangles, not triangles, squares. What is imperative is that the squares match square for square, 5 by 7. It doesn't matter what the actual sizes are as long as they are all squares. You see, squares are always proportional to each other. And in this case, we're going to be looking square for square at drawing our picture. The first square, the second square, the third square, the fourth square, the fifth square, all the way through. It's like a puzzle. Each of the pieces has to match in the end, which means that each of the parts of the picture have to fit exactly in each square and overlap each square to each side of them to make sure that the entire puzzle fits together and there are no gaps. The fact that squares are always proportional to themselves and to other squares is something that we can use to our advantage. If I encounter a particularly difficult square like this one in the middle, I can break it down into smaller squares if I need to. Once again, each of the squares within the square is proportional to other squares that I can draw then on the destination page. Here then is a contour line drawing generated from that original picture. It is held together by the grid in proportion. That proportion will remain constant throughout. To maintain the consistency of my proportion, I check it square for square. Whenever I go from one square to another, I make sure that all of the edges match the grid. With a grid this size, it's fairly easy to check my proportions by being able to tell if a contour line should go through the center of a line or a square, a third of the way down, a quarter of the way down on any given square. If I do run into difficulty, I can always break the grid into a smaller grid like I showed you just a little while ago. Now here you'll see me starting to put the values in and I'm checking it square for square. I'm also checking my contour lines square for square to make sure that they're accurate so that I don't put any values in the wrong place. It's a little bit more difficult to take out a dark value with an eraser than it is to take out a light contour line. You'll also notice that most of my contour lines and the grid itself are very lightly put in because that way I can get rid of them if I need to fairly easily. But if I put them in dark, they will stain the paper and dent it. Stained and dented paper can make all sorts of difficulty for you. It's not impossible to come back from them, it's just harder. So to make it easier, put in the contour line fairly lightly to begin with. Now I'm using this ebony Prismacolor pencil, which is actually a 2B, which is fairly dark, not extremely dark, but the lead is large and soft and blends fairly easily, so I can get it dark by blending it with this blending stump. Now a blending stump is usually just made from rolled up paper. In this case, it's rolled up newsprint and it's commercially bought. You can use paper towels, tissue paper, you can even use your fingers sometimes, depending on how neat you are, to make your graphite blend. When you do blend, however, make sure that you don't blend over any of your contours one into the other unless you want them to actually smear together. Usually you blend in discrete areas. You may also notice that as I go along, I'm taking out the grid. Quite often my values will go right over the grid and take it out, but if it's a light area, I need to take it out with my actual eraser just to make sure that it doesn't show up in the final picture. Now, as with most of my videos, you may have noticed that I'm going pretty fast here. I've sped up the video because you don't need to watch me do every little detail with my blending stump, but I'm going to keep this going for a little while here so that you can see the values being put in one at a time, put in with a pencil, then blended where they're supposed to be smooth. You'll also see parts of the picture start of appear as the negative space is filled in around the face. I'm not going to get to the face in this section of the video. I'll come back to that later. And I'll do a jump cut so that you can see 
putting in the values in different areas. It does not go anywhere nearly this quickly. This is about 20 times faster than it actually would have been. Just keep watching as the values go in. The contours are checked and the subtlety in the values in the original picture are also matched as well as I can bit by bit. If it gets a little bit darker, I get a little bit darker. If it gets a little bit lighter, I try to get a little bit lighter. I'm going to take a moment and talk about materials, in this case pencils, like the yellow one in the middle that says number 2 and HB. You might wonder what that means. What we call lead inside pencils, in this case drawing pencils, is not actually lead. It's a mixture of graphite and clay. Artist pencils are also arranged into ranges, the B range and the H range. Here I have placed several pencils from 6H to 6B in order of hardness, hard on the left and soft on the right. More clay in the mixture on the left, more graphite in the mixture on the right. The clay adds durability to the surface, but doesn't make much of a mark. The graphite gives you a great, dark, rich mark, but it crumbles. The harder the pencil, the more detail you can put into your picture, but the softer the pencil, the easier it is to put in darks and the more richly it blends. Using drawing pencils is often a trade-off between incredible detail or incredible darkness. Architectural drawings that need incredible detail and crisp sharp lines will often use pencils in the H range. Artists doing life studies and full value range drawings from light to dark will tend to use pencils in the B range. When doing life drawings, I usually use pencils from a 2H to a 6B. Other artists might pick a different range, but usually it's heavy on the darks. If you're wondering about the Prismacolor Ebony Pencil, the clay and graphite mixture inside is approximately equal to a 2B pencil. The diameter of the lead, however, is very large and allows you to apply quite a bit of it to your paper. I'm going to return now to the picture already in progress, putting in much of the shading as I go along, almost like it's a coloring book in black and white. When we deal with our contour lines at the beginning, we deal with line, and we deal with shape, and how they interplay and how they connect as precisely as possible. We then start looking at the forms and how things will look three-dimensional when the lights and darks are applied. The lights and darks are called values. We have light values, dark values, and different values in between. By carefully gauging these values and applying them to our contour line drawing, at the same time taking out the contour line drawing and allowing the values to take over and become the drawing itself, we end up with more heightened realism. Returning to our subject of the grid, it is a very common method for artists to use to scale pictures larger and smaller. If you want to put a picture on the side of a building, you start with a smaller image and you can grid it fairly easily using a chalk line and charcoal or pencils or whatever will make a mark on the side of the building and then paint it in like a coloring book. The method has actually been used for centuries and famously, Albrecht Dürer, a Renaissance artist, used a box with strings in it and a place to put his eye in order to break his world into a grid so that he could then draw it and engrave it. The key concept behind using a grid is proportion. If you have the same number of squares across and down from your original to your destination, and you draw exactly as you see in the squares, it makes it very easy to proportion your pictures to the proper size. Now you may see in these examples that some of them are from photographs, and some of them are mixtures of pictures that have been taken from magazines, photographs, etc., and put together. Whatever you can place within a grid, you can proportion to size, so you can make some very creative artwork that way. Whatever you do, you're probably going to have to scale using that four-letter word, math. Just remember that the squares on the original and the squares on the destination need to match up in the end. You use the grid to proportion, looking at your lines and shapes, 
Then you make your shapes into forms using value over the surface. Now it's time for you to go and make your own portrait.